Hey everybody, National Master Sean Lei here with a special treat today from the Lausanne 2020 Women's Grand Prix. So yesterday, there was a game between Zagnidze Nana from Georgia against Harika Dronavali from India. And it was a game that was well played on both sides. If you were to look from the beginning until about almost the very end, it was a game that was almost played perfectly with um, very dynamic positions. So let's get straight into the game now, all right? So the game began with pawn d4, very normal, and uh, Harika decided to play knight f6, knight f3, a more passive approach to this opening. Most people nowadays play pawn c4, trying to gain more space in the center, but knight f3 stops uh, really random moves like after c4, like pawn e5, the Budapest gambit, c5, the Bengals gambit, and f3 is generally a lot more solid. There are some issues with moves like knight f3 though, for example, it's probably not as flexible. In a lot of systems, we don't really want to bring out the knight here too early. But that is the trade-off we have for not playing c4 early on. After that pawn g6 is played, if boy wants to, she could have um, gotten into a king's Indian defense against pawn g6. But instead, she played knight c3, which goes into the Trigorin defense. Now, the Trigorin defense is not a very common opening in nowadays practice because, as you can see, the knight is on c3, which means this pawn cannot go to c4 or go to c3 to defend the d4 pawn. This is often not a very good thing because, well, the pawn wants to be on c4 so it can pressure d5 or it wants to be on c3 to defend d4. But knight on c3 early on does lead to some advantages as it does lead to some tricks in which the knight can go to b5. Sometimes it goes to a3. Sometimes it does a lot of things. Sometimes it prepares e4 as well. Now black doesn't allow e4. Now if you just play something like bishop g7, e4 comes and it's quite strong and it transposes to a perfect defense. However, d5 is played, stopping e4, and um, Nana just decides to play bishop f4 and putting the bishop on the long diagonal, allowing, you know, potentially knight b5 in the future, and with strong intentions, right? Knight b5 possibly allows our c-pawn to eventually move, with running c7 in check, though that's very, it's only in very rare circumstances that our opponents will allow that, and well, life is pretty good. So bishop g7, common, e3, and we're basically in a London system, except without a pawn on c3. Usually the knight's here to support this knight, but there are perks, again, for having the knight here instead of there. It's more active, for one. So the knight here, as we predicted, and the only move that kind of makes sense here is we're just going to develop the knight to a6, defending our c7 pawn, while still allowing us to go to c5 in the future, if we really want to. Now, here, instead of c4, the, pawn, the move pawn h3 is played, which is a very good move, and it's a very pragmatic move, and it's a move I suggest you guys try to find... Um, in your own games. This bishop, in case you guys haven't realized, is the bad bishop for black because, as you will see later on, the black pawns will be chaining in the black bishop. And so therefore, this bishop wants to come out somewhere safe, right? It probably wants to trade off for this super strong knight, and then that would be very good. Now, now not liking that, decided to play pawn to h3, stopping g4, knight, uh, bishop g4, and potentially a knight to g4. And this bishop is now stuck Going to a square it does not really want to go to. So after that, knight here is played, knight e4, putting the knight on a very strong square, and just the bishop d3, putting pressure on it. Then the pawn c6 move, as I suggested before, the knight is forced back, and then we have exchanges here. Now who stands off better in this position? Well, the answer is it's quite drawish in this position. Even though white has uh, arguably a worse pawn structure, correct? Black's pieces aren't the happiest. As you can see, this bishop's undeveloped. Where is it going to go? This knight isn't very happy on a6. Uh, is it going to go to c7? Who knows? It's not very happy. And even though this pawn structure is weak, if black doesn't do something, white well, will easily just play c4 and trade off the weakness very, very, very easily. And so white doesn't really have much to fear in these positions. So c5 is kind of forced. That's why we play knight a6 in the first place, so we can support this pawn push. And potentially with a move like this coming in, well, all of a sudden, black might have a pawn storm coming in, which is quite deadly against white. So we don't, uh, so white just castles after bishop d7, then we played our pawn c4 move. 
This move is a very normal idea, as I said. You don't really want to capture using your um, good bishop over here like this, because in a position like this, first of all, you can't capture here because, well, the capture over here and these are weaknesses. The reason why you don't want to do this is why, even though it leads to our opponent having weak pawns, is because, as you can see, our opponent has the open B file here, and it'll be him, uh, it'll be her who he'll be able to access these right squares. For example, let's just say your rook b1 was played, and now we can play a move like queen to a5, targeting the wake a2 and c3 pawn. This pawn it can never capture because we have a very strong bishop, and it's basically um, black who will have full control of this game from now on, from this point forward. So this is not very good. So instead, what was played was c4, breaking out, saying, if you capture here, I will capture back. If you capture here, I will capture back. And I will have a strong center, for example, something like this. And these positions are always preferably to play it for white because look at how strong the bishops are. The c4 pawn can move here, rook c1. And as you can see, we can slowly march our pawns off the board. We have what we call a hanging pawn structure, which is very dynamic and it's very, very strong. So after this, c takes d4 is played and knight to b4. This knight is finally coming back into the game defending here so if we take here this knight's very strong here because it's attacking our strong bishop and if we don't well it's attacking our strong bishop on d3 right now so this knight finally back in the game worst case scenario this knight can always retreat back to c6 and life is good for him uh her so knight b4 capture and bishop a4 was played saying knight captures is good it's not nothing wrong with it if you play knight captures it's still a good move but bishop a4 has better ideas and more tricky ideas for example, the queen can capture here, which is pretty strong. We activate our final piece. But more importantly, as you can see, all the pieces of black are quite active, right? In fact, in this position, this pawn is pinned here, right? It cannot capture. For example, if we capture here, this pawn can't capture back because this bishop can capture our queen. So here, what do you do as black? Like, oh, what do you do as white? Do you, can you just push the pawn forward? It's not advised. So what was played was queen d2, telling the knight to make its decision. Do you want to be on d5 or do you want to take on d3? Now to decide to take on d3 and the queen just took back because you don't want double pawns, which kind of makes sense, correct? And here the queen took and now this position, if we were to check the engine on the left over here, you can see that the position is quite equal. As you can see, it's very dryish. In fact, it's only plus 0 0.04.17. And there's not really much to fight for advantage. It's a slight advantage for white, that's by black's active pieces and bishop pairs because of the hanging pawn structure here. If black can manage to blockade a structure like this, then black will be better. But as long as white's pawn can get rolling like this, it is always going to be white that is slightly better because all the cards will be in her hands to play. So c4 is played, and now as you can see, white has a strong center. The queen is getting chased around. Queen f5 offering a queen trade. And Anna says no. Queen e3. And queen e3 is one of those moves you want to play. Because, well, you don't want to trade pieces and hanging pawn structures. Because in case you guys haven't watched our um, video on um, uh, weaknesses. Whenever you have a weakness, right? Especially a pawn weakness. Um, you don't want to trade off pieces. Because the more pieces that are traded off the less pieces you have to defend against your weaknesses and the less pieces you can use to push the space advantage that you have over here to victory because the pieces you have left just can't use it very properly. So queen e3 is just a very strong move. Rook a c8 attacking the weakness and rook a c1 and black decides to do a, what we call a blockading tactic. The rook is going to capture here and it's, it's pretty difficult for white to find a solution. Moves like c5 are never good because now, as you can see, guess who is blockaded on the light squares after a move like this? It might not be the best move, but let's just say this. These pawns can never move, and they'll just be targets for black to attack until the end of the game. The game is completely in the control of the black pieces. So here instead, white decided to trade off her bishop over here for a pawn over there. So what happens is rook captures here, bishop captures on g7, King captures on g7, and queen takes e7. Materials equal, but as you can see, it's going to be a strong bishop, strong queen, strong rook against not-so-strong pieces of white. And white still has a weakness on d4 that 
she might want to try to get rid of if she wants to get a draw in this game. In this position, I would say black already is slightly better due to the activity of her pieces and the strength that this bishop can potentially get on this long diagonal over here. Rook ac8, doubling up on the very important c file. Rook e1 is played, doubling up on the e file. Rook c7 chasing the queen. The queen just says, okay, all right. And the queen goes over here. And as you can see, white doesn't really want to trade queens because, as I said before, with queens traded, it favors the side with less weaknesses. Queen a3 is played, defending the rook on c1. Bishop to e4. And now, my question for you guys here is, if you guys were playing white, what move would you play here in order for you guys to gain an advantage? So, or not an advantage, sorry. What move would you guys play here? Let me get back to the position. In order to keep the equality in this game. In this game, this is where white made a mistake and, and resigned in a few moves. Let's see if you can play better with this knowledge in hand and figure out what not to do in this position and not what not to make, what mistakes not to make. All right, I hope you guys paused the videos. In the game, the move that was played was knight e5. And after this, uh, after the opponent's next two moves, white resigned the game. Why is knight e5 a blunder? Knight e5 is trying to go for an idea in which black can just trade off everything. And once everything is traded off, in the end, even though white is slightly worse because um, black has better pieces and white still has the weakness on d4, it's going to be rather hard to try to win those positions, though it will be black trying to push for a win. The problem here is that after rook captures after rook captures here, which is what was played in the game, the rook is forced to capture. Queen cannot capture because rook c takes on c1. But the winning move, I hope you guys can find it. If you guys still haven't figured it out, just pause your videos. It's not a very hard one. We just go for the simple queen g5. We're checkmating over here, or we're winning the rook. If you play a move like g3, we just capture your rook for free. And that is an easy game from then on. So what could you have played instead? What is the move that should have been played? It's just rook takes c6 first. And the idea is, if you take here, I'll take your rook, easy peasy. And if you capture back with any piece, let's say the bishop, now we can play knight e5, attacking your bishop, and even though we have a weakness, the game will just play on, as you can see through the evaluation on the left. It's very drawish. In fact, um, black is just slightly 0.12 better, which are just completely equal. Because our knight is active, we have a weakness, but it, our opponent has a light square bishop, so they can't really attack our weakness. And if we really want to, we can just defend like this. So a game could have played out with moves like h5, knight takes c6, rook takes c6. Queen takes a7, rook to c2, going very active over here, rook f1, queen to d5, and even though black is down a pawn in this position, as you can see, the pieces are much more active, and in the end game, we rather have more active pieces than more pawns, right? Because in the end game, that's what matters. So a3 could be played, rook d2, as you can see, because of the activity of the pieces, black gets the pawn back with ease, it's not much to do. And after something like this is played, this is very drawn. There's not much to play for after this. And this is a theoretical draw in this position because material is equal. So unfortunately for Mrs. Nana over here, um, she played knight e5, which was a blunder. As you can see through the evaluation, it's negative 9. And so she probably resigned. Luckily for her, or well, not luckily, but with great skill, she was able to win her next round. And she was able to recover from this disastrous game over here. Now, this game is just a good, it's a good show that even though both players play perfectly, even at the highest level here, one mistake is all it takes to lose a game. And that even like grandmasters like these make mistakes like this in uh, important tournaments like these. So don't be too uh, upset whenever you guys lose a game like this, because even the best can. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, smash that like button below. Subscribe for more exhilarating chess content, and I hope to see you again in a future video. This is Sean Lay, signing off.